The answer to the question, can America be happy under a government of her own, is short and simple. As happy as she pleases, she hath a blank sheet to write upon. Your country was never more in danger than the present moment. The long knives of Kentucky and the whiskey boys of the woods of Pennsylvania are all raring for insurrection and confusion. New York Gazette. Children do not vote. Why? Because they have no will of their own. The common people can be as little trusted with the public interest. Governor Morris. What a triumph for our enemies to find that we cannot govern ourselves. That systems of government founded on equality are merely an ideal. In 1783, Americans had won their independence. All of Europe waited and watched to see if the upstart revolutionaries could govern themselves. The United States of America was barely united at all. Many conflicting groups had joined together to fight off English rule. Could they continue to work together now that the war was over? Today, we honor the United States Constitution as the greatest blueprint for government ever written. But at the time, many saw the Constitution as the end of liberty and the death of the American Revolution. What was lost and what was gained in making our national government? Was the Constitution the crowning glory of the American Revolution? Or the compromising of its hopes and dreams? How few of the human race have ever enjoyed an opportunity of making an election of government? John Adams. With independence, Americans started their new nation based on the radical new ideas of equality and of government by the people. Republicanism, as they called it, was great in principle, but no one knew if it would work in the real world. The first independent governments in America were the governments of the 13 independent states, not the federal government. So each state had its own set of decisions to make about what kind of government it would create in place of the old British government. Everyone in America agreed that the government should be based upon the consent of the people. But their agreement ended. Some people wanted rule by the best and the brightest, the very wealthy uh, planters and merchants who had been the traditional leaders of society, while others wanted a full-scale democracy, a government in which ordinary citizens as well as wealthy citizens would play a full and active role. Following the English model, Massachusetts created two legislatures, an upper house for the men of wealth, a lower house for the common people, and an executive branch run by a governor elected by the people rather than a king. Some states took seriously the idea that all men are created equal. Pennsylvania designed a government with one big legislature, where poor farmers and artisans could argue with rich merchants and businessmen. New Jersey even gave some women and blacks the right to vote. Some things the states could not do by themselves. Winning the war for independence demanded that they work together. But Americans' fear of powerful governments made it difficult for the states to work together. The Continental Congress had to fight the Revolutionary War without the power to build an army or raise money through taxes. They begged the states for money and men to keep the Continental Army fighting. But with money problems of their own, the states often said no. It took five years for the states to ratify the Articles of Confederation, which was more like a treaty of cooperation between 13 little countries than the beginning of a new nation. The idea of equality breathes through all, and every individual feels ambitious to be in a situation not inferior to his neighbors. For many Americans, the years following the War for Independence were a time to experience freedom and equality. In the New Republic, more men shared political power than anywhere else in the world. Celebrating their new equality, they proudly wore their homespun clothes and called each other Mr. and Mrs., titles only the upper class could use before. 
principles of republicanism were also used to resolve one of the thorniest disputes between the states, control of the Western territories. To get the other states to sign the Articles of Confederation, the states that controlled the vast lands beyond the Appalachian Mountains agreed to cede their lands to the national government. The Northwest Ordinance guaranteed that when enough people moved into each territory, they could join as a state equal to the others. It also banned the entrance of slave owners with their chattel property in the Northwest Territory, a major step in the long struggle for liberty. Americans poured into the West, farmers leaving the crowded East, soldiers starting a new life, and immigrants just arriving in the United States began to buy land and move West. Fathers, mothers, sons and daughters, young and old, all mixed together, and talk and joke so that you cannot discover any distinction made or any respect shown to one more than to another. Ideas of equality changed the lives of women and children. In the new Republican society, children were more than just wage earners for the family. More and more, they won the rights from their parents to choose who they wanted to marry. Government by the people required that citizens choose their leaders wisely. Because they were the first teachers of young citizens, American women had an important new political role to play, teaching their children the virtues and patriotism essential for the survival of the republic. A movement also began to support free public schools that would educate everyone, not just those who could afford to pay. Some radicals, like Benjamin Rush of Philadelphia, believed that women should go to school. Others, like Yale President Timothy Dwight, disagreed. After all, he said, who will make our puddings? The belief in equality also affected the lives of African Americans. In 1777, Vermont became the first territory to outlaw slavery. Over the next 20 years, the other northern states would end slavery outright or pass laws that set slaves free over time. Newly freed blacks in northern cities became active in business and formed their own thriving communities where ideas of freedom, equality, and social justice came to life. In Philadelphia, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones started the first black churches in America. People who had been slaves just a few years before were building their own churches, creating their own schools, organizing their own mutual aid societies. And that's so remarkable because we're talking about people who as slaves, whites would have said, couldn't do it. Independence may have allowed Americans to undertake a great experiment in Republican government and society but it also hurt many people financially. One of the consequences of the American Revolutionary War was that the Americans lost their most important trading partner, the nation of England. This uh, worked tremendous hardship on American merchants and indeed on American farmers. With little power to make policies, Congress watched helplessly as the states engaged in trade wars and passed laws at odds with those in other states. From Massachusetts to Georgia, the feeling was growing that the Articles of Confederation needed to be changed. In Massachusetts, tight money and rising taxes had forced many farmers deep into debt. Facing loss of their farms and no help from the state government back in Boston, the farmers, in the best tradition of the American Revolution, held protest meetings, signed petitions, and organized committees or correspondence. When all else failed, they armed themselves with pitchforks and muskets to keep judges from turning their properties over to the Boston merchants and others who held their mortgages. For six months, the farmers petitioned and protested, and still no relief. Finally, the farmers lost their patience. On a snowy day in January 1787, Revolutionary war hero Daniel Shays and a ragtag army of 1,200 farmers marched toward Springfield. They attempted to, in fact, among other things, beside closing down courts, to take the federal arsenal of Springfield, Massachusetts. 
General William Shepard and 600 militiamen greeted them with musket and cannon, killing four and scattering the rest. That rebellion frightened many thoughtful Americans into believing that the absence of power in the federal government under the Autos Confederation to suppress such insurrection was a fatal weakness and a more efficient and powerful government had to be created. It would decide forever the fate of Republican government. James Madison. The 55 delegates who came to Philadelphia in May of 1787 were an honor roll of the American Revolution. Church bells rang and cannons boomed as George Washington and other war heroes rode into Philadelphia. Almost all of the delegates were men of wealth and property, the political leaders of their states. Meeting in Independence Hall, the convention voted to lock the doors, nail shut the windows, and do their arguing in private. Secrecy would allow them to speak their minds without fear of attack by the public. Convinced that the nation needed a whole new plan of government, James Madison of Virginia had written a new constitution before coming to the convention. His Virginia plan shocked many delegates, for it created a national government much stronger than the states. Madison's vision of the central government in contrast to the old Articles of Confederation, was a government with the power to tax. It was a government with the power to regulate commerce. It was a government whose laws would be superior to those laws passed by the state governments. Madison also called for two houses of Congress, the House of Representatives, elected by the people, and the Senate, elected by the House of Representatives. A president would be elected by Congress. The Virginia Plan also called for the number of each state's representatives to be determined by population rather than one vote for each state, no matter how large or small it was, which was the way it worked under the Articles of Confederation. The smaller states immediately objected. The question of uh, representation in both the upper and the lower house of this new national government uh, would occasion the most bitter debate in the convention. Indeed, the convention was nearly paralyzed from the middle of May to early July on this question of the proper uh, method of apportioning representation. Opponents countered with the New Jersey plan, which would maintain the basic sovereignty of the states, but give the Congress more power. To protect the rights of small states, it would keep the one state, one vote system that represented all states equally. After three days of angry debate, the states voted seven to three in favor of a modified version of the Virginia Plan that substantially strengthened the federal government. But many questions remained unanswered about representation, about how much power the new federal government would have, and about many other issues. By the beginning of July, the delegates were deadlocked. The small states refused to accept any plan that did not offer them equal representation. The stifling heat and clash of tempers drove the convention to the breaking point. Many threatened to go home. While the delegates took a break for Independence Day, a small group led by Benjamin Franklin worked feverishly to save the convention. What finally came out of it was that the House of Representatives would have a representation based upon population and that all states would have equal representation in the Senate. So each section felt it got something to protect its interest and that formed the basis for the Great Compromise or the Connecticut Compromise which established our two houses of Congress and the present mode of representation. Can you imagine what it would be like today if we said we'll start over again and now we'll uh, create a new constitution and we'll meet in a small room without air conditioning in the middle of a humid hot summer I don't know whether we could pull it off it was some people called it the miracle at Philadelphia love your children if you love your country if you love the God of love clear your hands from slaves Burden not your children or country with them. Richard Allen. 
Slavery was another thorny issue with which the delegates had to contend. Three compromises prevented Southern delegates from walking out of the convention. The Constitution would allow the slave trade to continue for 20 years, oblige non-slave states to give escaped slaves back to their masters, and count slaves for both taxation and representation in Congress, but only as three-fifths of a free man. What's fascinating about the whole thing is that the word slavery never appears in the Constitution anywhere. And in fact, it doesn't appear in any constitutional matters until the 13th Amendment, which ab abolishes slavery. And if you didn't know what you were looking for, and you read the Constitution, you would not know that this was a slaveholding nation. Nothing is more certainly written in the Book of Fate than that these people are to be free. I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that His justice cannot sleep forever. Thomas Jefferson. By the end of the convention, many compromises, large and small, produced a constitution that many doubted could survive. Many people in the states believed that the new constitution centralized power and in centralizing power endangered the states. They were deeply concerned about also the absence of any form of Bill of Rights in the new government because that would also protect the rights of citizens and of states. And so they were deeply concerned because they thought that the founders had in fact drawn something that could not possibly work and really would endanger the liberty which had come out of the American Revolution. Angry that the Constitution took so much power away from the states, other delegates went home early and promised to fight it to an early death. The men who designed the Constitution knew they would have a fight getting the states to agree to their new federal government. Acceptance or rejection would be decided by special conventions whose delegates were elected by the people, not appointed by the states. Nine states had to say yes for the new government to begin. Supporters of the Constitution, called Federalists, found its greatest defense in the Federalist Papers, a series of articles written by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. A strong central government, they insisted, was the best protector of the people. The Constitution would balance the clash of selfish interests against each other so that no group could overpower any other. The Constitution's opponents, called anti-federalists, argued that it violated the principles of the American Revolution by creating a government more like a monarchy than a republic. Republics must stay small and close to home. Only strong states could protect the liberties of the people. The debates over ratification raged nationwide in hundreds of letters, pamphlets, newspapers, polite conversations, and barroom brawls. Small farmers in the West mistrusted the wealthy politicians back East. Southerners felt that the Constitution was a plot by Northern businessmen to steal power from their states. Angered by the slavery compromise, Northerners fired back that they didn't need lessons in liberty from slaveholders. Some states ratified the Constitution quickly. In Massachusetts, Sam Adams geared up for a fight, only to discover that many of the old Boston revolutionaries wanted the new Constitution. The loss of trade made them desperate and artisans gambled their dreams of political power in the hope that a strong national government would increase trade and get them back to work. In Virginia and New York, two of the largest and most important states, the struggle went on longer. Fiery Patrick Henry led the charge against the Constitution in Virginia, fearful about the loss of liberty. But in the end, James Madison convinced Virginians to approve the Constitution by promising to add a Bill of Rights to limit the government's power. Up in New York, frontier farmers suspected that more government meant more taxes and less power. Frustrated Federalists in New York City, led by Alexander Hamilton, threatened to join the Union on their own. In a hard-fought election, New York approved the Constitution by only three votes.
Long live George Washington, President of the United States. With a crowd looking on from Wall Street, George Washington stepped out onto the balcony of Federal Hall in New York City and took his oath of office as the first President of the United States on April 30th, 1789. The Federalists won their new national government. To assure the Anti-Federalists that the rights of the people would be protected, ten amendments were added to the Constitution in 1791. Modeled on the English Bill of Rights, which had guaranteed the rights of Englishmen back in the late 17th century, the American Bill of Rights has protected the rights of individuals from that day to this. Some of these amendments promised Americans freedom. The first nine amendments included guarantees of freedom of speech and the press. These rights allow Americans to express the problems they have with their government without being punished. Religious freedom is also guaranteed, preventing Congress from making laws that favor one religion over another. This helped to establish the separation between church and state that allows people from many different religions to live happily under one government. The first nine amendments also guaranteed American citizens the right to bear arms and protected the rights of people accused of crime. The Tenth Amendment was designed to protect states' rights and limit the power of the federal government. It reserved the power not delegated to the federal government and gave it to the states. The Bill of Rights endure as the foundation of our rights and liberties. Through every period of American history, they have promised citizens the right to be treated fairly by their government. When Washington and the new Congress took office in 1789, they faced the challenge of setting the new nation on a new course. From the start, they divided over which direction the nation should be taking. Alexander Hamilton thought that the new nation was destined to grow rich and powerful through developing industry and a strong national government. He called the United States a Hercules in the cradle. But if the nation failed to pay off the enormous debt left over from the Revolutionary War, the new country would soon die. President Washington appointed Hamilton Secretary of Treasury and made him his top advisor on all economic and fiscal policies. Hamilton designed a program to pay off Americans' war debts by having the federal government take over the state's debts and pay them in full. This hurt southern states that had already paid off much of their debt. Opponents complained that his program favored rich northern businessmen and would concentrate even more power in the hands of the federal government. The southern states finally agreed to Hamilton's plan. In exchange, they got the capital moved from Philadelphia to the new District of Columbia, an area carved out of a barren, swampy wasteland on the Maryland-Virginia border. They would call the new capital Washington, D.C. But how did Hamilton plan to pay off the debt? Part of the answer was what so many Americans feared, more taxes. The whiskey tax was the last straw for some of the farmers of western Pennsylvania. As far as they could see, this new tax made the rich men richer while taxing the farmers into poverty. Rallying under the banner of liberty, they threatened tax collectors, terrorized their neighbors who paid the tax, then marched on Pittsburgh and threatened to burn the city to the ground. The Whiskey Rebellion was the first challenge to the new government's rule. And it became the first occasion for the, for the provision in the Constitution that the federal government would have the power to march uh, a federal army into a state to put down a state insurrection. And this is what happened. There was Alexander Hamilton and George Washington uh, leading a federal army into western Pennsylvania to put down those whiskey rebels. Rather large army, larger than any that 
Washington actually had under his command during the American Revolution. And by the time they got there, the Whiskey Rebels disappeared into the woods. They dispersed, they faded away, they were hard to find. A few were arrested and tried and jailed, but the dispute was over. An insurrection was announced and proclaimed and armed against, but could never be found. Thomas Jefferson scoffed at the government's excessive use of strength. Jefferson and others were growing increasingly alarmed about developments in the federal government. And in the 1790s, war in Europe was cutting through American politics like a knife, splitting Americans into two angry factions, Federalists and Democratic Republicans. In 1789, Americans had applauded the French people when they rose up, overthrew their king, and started a French Republic. The French people wanted the same rights listed in the American Declaration of Independence. But then France went to war with England, and the French Revolution took a bloody turn. Americans read with horror the accounts of noblemen and their families butchered at the guillotine while wild, gleeful mobs seemed to demand more and more blood. Should Americans support a republic that had turned to murder? For the Federalists, the French Revolution's bloody reign of terror proved that rule by common people would end in anarchy and ruin. Besides, they had begun to trade with England again, and the American economy was booming. Americans who supported the French and wanted to rein in the growing power of the federal government gathered in democratic-republican societies, angrily demanding that America help the French people against the tyrants of Europe. The French Revolution is the real revolution, they said, the one where the people finally take power away from the wealthy. The French had saved Americans in their struggle for freedom and equality. Now the United States must help the French. Although President Washington declared that the United States would not take either side in the war, the nation found itself caught in the middle. French and English warships confiscated American merchant ships for trading with the enemy. By 1796, political passions were running high. After George Washington chose not to run for a third term in office, John Adams was elected the second president of the United States. Fearing a full-scale war with France, Congress authorized taxes to build a new navy and expand the army. Adams did his best to keep the nation out of war. But opposition continued to grow against the president and his Federalist allies in Washington. The Democratic-Republican societies found their leader in Thomas Jefferson. He seemed to be on the opposite side of every argument the Federalists made. They believed in a strong central government. Jefferson thought that government is best which governs least. The Federalists did not trust the people to rule. Jefferson believed that all the people needed was to learn how to rule. The Federalists wanted a strong nation built on economic self-interest. Jefferson favored a nation of independent farmers built on virtue and equality. With the nation's very survival at stake, new journals sprang up to argue their cause, criticizing their opponents with a viciousness unparalleled in American history. Federalist and Democratic-Republican journalists went at each other in print and with fists. Americans had no experience with political parties, and many Federalists thought the Democratic-Republican opposition treasonous by its very existence. Surely we need a sedition law to keep our own rogues from cutting our throats, and an alien law to prevent the invasion by a host of foreign rogues to assist them. William Cobbett, Federalist Journalist. In 1798, Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Acts to restrain their political enemies, making it a crime to write, speak, or publish anything against the government. The Alien and Sedition Acts put a clamp on the freedom of the press. 
They, it was passed by a Federalist Congress and was aimed at the Jeffersonian press. Jefferson had run for president in 1796 and had lost, but the Jeffersonian press was pumped up for the election that would be coming up in 1800. And the Alien and Sedition Acts were used to say that much of what was in the Jeffersonian press was seditious. I mean, even to say that John Adams uh, was an irresponsible president could be regarded as a seditious statement. Even Benjamin Franklin's grandson, a Philadelphia publisher, was clapped into jail for saying some very uncomplimentary things about President John Adams and the Federalist Party. Those acts were really a test of the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment to the Constitution, and they were quickly reversed in 1800 as soon as Jefferson won the election of that year. The presidential election of 1800 was one of the most contentious in American history. The Federalists called Jefferson a godless French spy out to destroy Christianity and America. The Democratic Republicans accused John Adams of being a power-hungry snob and a lover of English monarchy. When the results were finally in, the Democratic Republicans had won. Americans had chosen the many over the few. I have this morning witnessed one of the most interesting scenes a free people can ever witness. The changes of administration, which in every government, in every age, have most generally been epochs of confusion, villainy, and bloodshed, in this, our happy country, take place without any species of distraction or disorder. Margaret Smith, Philadelphia. The Federalists handed over power without incident in 1800. It was a truly revolutionary moment. Democracy worked. The Republic would survive. The year before, the bloody French Revolution had ended when Napoleon came to power. This proved how easy it was for a Republic to fail. But through the art of compromise, the United States of America had survived. That in itself was revolutionary. The night before he stepped down from office, President Adams had appointed 42 new judges to the federal courts, all of them Federalists. The Republicans soon got rid of many of Adams' midnight judges, but John Marshall, the new Chief Justice of the United States, would have a tremendous impact on the future of the nation. In 1803, in the case of Marbury versus Madison, Marshall laid the foundation for judicial review of laws passed by Congress. In a series of groundbreaking decisions during the 34 years he would serve as Chief Justice, Marshall would elevate the Supreme Court to an equal third branch of government. Congress passed laws, but the Marshall Court established that it was up to the Supreme Court to decide if those laws were legal, according to the Constitution. In the United States, more people participated in politics than anywhere else in the world. But there were still many who were left out. The peaceful transfer of power to the Republicans only intensified political conflict. The struggles over the nature and future of the Republic were just beginning. When Thomas Jefferson stepped down from office in 1809, the infant Republic had proven its strength and durability. The acquisition in 1803 of a vast territory west of the Mississippi River had also begun a westward expansion that would soon witness American expansion all the way to the Pacific Ocean.